I was a punk rocker from the 80s, antichrist, anarchist, hated everything about authority, religion. Your uncle let me hide in his garage when I wasn't saved. Someone <laughs> was actually trying to kill me and I, I wow. needed to get away. My wife was seven months pregnant with our second child. And uh, she, it was one of those crummy hospitals in LA. You got to see a different doctor every time. And we were already there going and this doctor said, your baby's dead. There's no heartbeat. And we think the baby's been dead a while. And we're like, I was just here a week ago. We seen a heartbeat. Can we do this again? I'm praying. I'm like, this is where you get a miracle. God's going to move. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, we go back and the baby's dead. Well, I just celebrated 31 years of pastoring. Wow. Uh, I got saved, like you said, at age 19 uh, as a punk rocker, drug addict. Your uncle let me hide in his garage when I wasn't saved. Someone <laughs> was actually trying to kill me and I, I wow. needed to get away. And I was still on drugs. I got radically saved after three days on speed and I came in that garage and I fell to my knees. I was a punk rocker from the 80s, antichrist, anarchist, hated everything about authority, religion. And um, I felt them. I don't even know why I fell to my knees. Something pushed me down. I said, God, if you're real, I've been shooting up Coke and heroin and other junk for, I OD twice time I was 16. So I lived on my own since I was 15. And uh, I said one prayer, I couldn't even explain it. I never drank, never got high, never smoked a mm. cigarette, didn't have a withdrawal. I had hepatitis, they prayed over me. The doctor said it left me. He took me to church the next day, I never left, never left. And uh, got married at 21 and got sent, announced a pastor at 25. Now, you said you got married at 21, mm -hmm. and people may not believe this, but I was actually there at the wedding. Yes, you were. Your <laughs> mom and dad were the best man and maid of honor at my wedding, and your mom was at like eight or nine months pregnant with you. So I was in there. there. You were at my wedding. <laughs> None of these other guys can say that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's incredible. Um, like, blown away, the connection of your family and, uh, and you, what God's done in your life. Uh, very blessed. Your mom and dad were the home Bibles. My, my wife was going to your mom and dad's home Bible study. Wow. You have this radical conversion. You say there was no withdrawals. You never touched any drug again after that point. No, nothing. And so, I burned, I like, I'm done. It was like, I couldn't explain it. I knocked on the front door and I go, something happened to me. To your uncle, I go, I, I don't know what it is. Something happened to me. I think that safe thing you're talking about. Was I was there for three weeks but that's a whole nother story. He lets me live in his garage while I'm not saved. Wow. Hoping that I would get saved. Where are wow. those Christians? I always wonder, like, is it, does it have to lead up to that moment of just complete brokenness to see that conversion? I, I think, okay, um, well, I would say it like this. Forgiven of much, love much. Mm. So, like, uh our kids didn't grow up in those environments yeah. and our hope is they don't do the things we do and we should be breaking that cursed environment. Am I ashamed of what I did? Oh gosh, yeah, it was evil. You know, robbing, stealing, selling drugs and home invasions, it was bad. But if that's what it took mm, wow. for me to, I know God loves me more than my family loves me. God loves us more than, he loves our kids more than us. And so, like, who cares? If I yeah. have to be in the pig pen yeah. or I grow up filled with the Holy Spirit in my mother's womb like Diga and John the <laughs> yeah. Baptist. I got filled with the Holy Spirit at your wedding. There it no, is. There it <laughs> is. <laughs> you probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, like, you know, it's like, seriously, think about that. Here, yeah. Here's uh, Diga, you know, grew up very young. I've known him, writing books this young age and, a passion to do something for God. He didn't have to experience it, but he got radically saved. Yeah. I think one, one thing is, to your question is, is our perspective is everything. Mm. We perspect drugs, well, heroin is worse than hate. Mm. 
LSD is worse than lying when they're yeah. all sin. Yeah. And so sometimes we get self-righteous. I, I, I honestly, this is a true story. I hope I'm not getting in trouble, but your dad, when we were all young in the church, your dad, I, was, I got close to him, and he shared with me growing up in the church because your grandparents were saved, he said, with all these gang members getting saved, there was a moment that I thought I didn't have a testimony, mm -hmm. that I had to go, go out and do something wow. to be really saved. But then our pastor would say, my testimony is greater. I've never drank. Mm -hmm. I've never done this. And you have to stop and think, wow, that's, that's pretty crazy. So like, it's all perspective, yeah. you know? So, well, I was told by a close friend when I said something similar, and I had similar conversations with my dad, you know, especially in our churches, we would have various different people coming through, sharing testimonies that spanned various different backgrounds, and you would hear of the ex-convict or the ex-gang member or the ex-this and that, and it was tempting in that environment to say, well, I don't have a testimony, or what story can I share? And this close friend of mine tells me, well, your testimony is what God kept you from. Yeah. I just think in the wickedness of the world today, the fact that someone can say, I never done that, mm. yeah. for someone from my world, I think that's insane. That's, a, that's mm. so awesome. I can't even imagine that. You, you, you get what I'm saying? So there's a lot of perspective if you have the right one. Because, you know, if you're just thinking like, you know, there's an old shirt that says, the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> um, some guys just want to outdo each other with their testimony. So like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I have a radical one, but like, it's no different than yours. Mm -hmm. We all need to get saved. Yeah. Yes, as a parent in the natural, you don't want your kids to go to jail and OD and all that. So scary. Uh, but what if, if that's the only way for them to fall in the pig pen. Right. Is it worth it? They're going to heaven? Heck yeah, it's worth it. Yeah. Was there anyone prior to that point that had looked at you with hope or had everyone just sort of cast you aside and said, that's a hopeless situation? Um, my dad, who I didn't have much of a relationship with, just got saved right around the same time I did. I really didn't have a relationship with him, but... He, uh, well, I, uh, he tried to witness to me. And then about one in the morning on my way to the garage with two girls. The encounter podcast is brought to you in part by NUMA streaming. It's about time. The kingdom of God had its own streaming platform. NUMA features preachers and teachers of the word. And best of all, NUMA does not censor them for sharing biblical truth. NUMA is growing fast and currently features creators like David Diga Hernandez, Vlad Savchuk, Spencer Nakamura, and many more. You can watch NUMA streaming for free using their website or one of their apps. Additionally, a portion of all NUMA profits goes to supporting Christian ministries. The future of Christian media is here. Start watching for free by going to streamnuma.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-N-U-M-A.com. And then about one in the morning, on my way to the garage with two girls, in LA, and he's not in LA, uh, I see his van, I Heart Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, this is in my book, but this is pretty dark. I'm like, what is he doing here? I'm loaded. I'm on LSD. I ran him off the road as I figured it out, and I opened up the van. He's with a prostitute. Jeez. And he's got his head on the steering wheel, and he's, got, he's crying, and I go, don't ever tell me that Jesus stuff. Wow. Man. And... I was such an angry person. Um, I couldn't wait to go drive that next week, just to go over there and just go off. I mean, he had his own company in Whittier and um, California. It, get it, wherever, whoever's listening. But I uh, went over there to go tell him off. And he goes, before you say anything, he's trying to tell me. I really didn't care for him at all. He left us when I was six weeks old, so like I didn't have no relationship. And he, he starts telling me, you know why your grandfather doesn't like church? We, you never went, and how they hang there. I go, he goes, we used to go to church and uh, when we were young, and a deacon molested me. 
and I've been battling with lust. He's telling me this. Now, I'm a cold-blooded sinner, and my first time in my life, man, I felt sorry for this guy. He was actually going to John Wimber's church. Oh, wow. And uh, in Anaheim, and he goes, uh, I'm going through deliverance. I didn't know what that meant. I just know that, man, your dad just tells you that and happened in church. I, I felt bad for him. And uh, I mean, dad's radically saved now. He's been saved for years. And, uh, but, you know, so that would pretty much only be it, him. So eventually you did get saved. You have that encounter in the garage. And then you fast forward a few years, age 21, you're getting married. Mm hmm. And then after that, how does that calling on your life begin to reveal itself? When I was a new convert, uh, I went to a conference and I heard a message from your uncle. Really, it was Bobby. And uh, it was at a big bowl arena. And I heard this man say, God wants to use you. And I'm sitting there thinking, me? God has a plan for your life. And I just started just like, really, the God who created this universe, who said, let there be light, who created everything, wants to use me. I don't know what, but like, it didn't, like you could preach, he could use your life. I don't know why, but I remember running down the stairs into that field to the altars. And I just cried out, God, if you want to use me, I'll do whatever. Wow. And, and part of it, the Bible says, forgive them much, love much. That was my, my mentality was, I was so crazy as a sinner, why would I give God less? Wow. I didn't pray about doing stuff. I just did it. I think sometimes with us Christians, we, we pray about <laughs> things and we're just delaying things. All right. Let me pray about tithing. No, just do it, okay? Let me pray about telling somebody about Jesus. No, just open up your mouth. The devil's not telling you to do it. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray about things, but like you get what I'm saying. I totally understand. And that's always been my mindset. Why would I give the devil more devotion mm. of my time, my talent, and my treasure than I would God? Wow. That's always been my mentality. And um, that was it. Uh, I, I went up to... My pastor and said, uh, there's a girl named Esther Garcia. I never really talked to her. I said, what do you think? You know, I want to do something for God. And he goes, she's a good girl, praying fast. I literally, was on, uh, I think it was on a Wednesday. And I fasted right there, no water, no food for three days. Wow. And then I went the next two days with just water. And then Sunday night, I walked up to her, and I said, hey, I've been praying and fasting if it's God's will that you marry me and we go out and preach the gospel. That was pretty much my first time <laughs> talking to her. Wow. I wow. got to know how she responded wow. to that. I, dude, I, you know, I was so raw, but my mentality was like, man, I got to know. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, literally said, uh, I've been praying and fasting for you. She literally Jeez. said that. Oh, Jeez, wow. That's crazy. That, it is. It's a true, true story. Yeah. And so... Uh, uh, now, that had to be God. You're not prescribing this as the method of finding I, a, a no, wife. No, no, but so many guys in my church have tried it, and it failed every <laughs> yeah, time. Girls would be like, stop sharing your testimony, Pastor. Oh, These guys man. are stalking me. <laughs> oh, man. I'm serious, bro. But it happened. And, uh, you know, my, I was all in. Um, so the next five or six years, we got we got married in 88 and then we uh i'm not going to get in debt it was just my mindset I, I i know what i want to do yeah i just want to be that and then it came up the the conference and we got announced and so when you say the conference came up and we got announced i'll say this to the listener who maybe doesn't have context yeah. for how our fellowship was structured so we basically were a part of a church multiplication movement yeah. Like a, if you'll envision a family tree where one will send out three and those three will each send out four or five. So it's basically like a book of Acts model with a little more formality in yeah. terms of how the, the ministries it, it, themselves It was are crazy. It was very sovereign. It didn't come from a book or a plan. It just yeah. was right. it, very organic. And now I wasn't around at the beginning of it because this was it, it really was coming off of the crest of the Jesus People movement yeah. that this movement began to take shape. Um, but 
it, they believed in what was called radical release, where they would build up disciples from within the church and then radically release them into the ministry. And this is the context of where you the were cult, sent out. The culture was, I'm here to help you fulfill your destiny. Mm. That was the culture. Very different than a lot of places today. Yes. And it was like, if you're called, I want to help you. Uh, the pastor would say, if you don't do better than me, I failed you. That's so unheard of now. And, uh, but anyway, we came, I never been to Kansas city in my life. And we came there. And That's where they sent you. Now who, who decided on the city? Was it the sending ministry? Was it something that was always on your heart? How did that, how, did how, that how long is this broadcast? We got as much time as you want. Okay. So I wanted to go to Chicago for six years. Wow. I fasted and prayed. And for those that don't know this, there used to be buildings in cities called libraries. Mm. It, there was books What's in that? there. Yeah, people don't know what those are no more. <laughs> so back then, I wanted to go to Chicago. I felt God tell me to go to Chicago. I wanted to go to Chicago. I prayed. I fasted. I felt God speak to me. I spoke to the pastor. Okay, you're going to go to Chicago when it's time. For five years, I'm just like all in. And uh, when it came to the conference I was going to get sent out on, pastor came to me and said, hey, uh, me and Esther, it was like three months before, and he said, are you, open to, um, are you open to take over the church in Sacramento? We have about 90 adults there. The pastor's going to make a change, and I know you're going out. I wanted to give you first opportunity. Will you pray about it? We prayed about it. I went back and spoke to the pastor. said, look, I don't feel peace about it. Thank you. And uh, he wasn't a controlling man at all. He said, no, no problem. We'll, we'll figure it out. The next day, I lost. A, or I was a union job. I lost a contract, and nine of his drivers got laid off, and I didn't have a job. Two weeks later, he offered me the same scenario, a church in Redding, California. Same exact scenario. Let me pray about it. The next day, <laughs> it's a Wednesday, and somehow I get called up on the stage. And on the stage, I'm sharing a story how I got carjacked a, couple, a year before. The devil's a liar. I stood on God's word. I got my car back. You know, everyone's shouting. And at the back of the stage, there's a little gangbanger usher going like this. And I'm like, I'm 25, man. I never get on stage. You have to wait. When I got off the stage, he goes, hey, while you were talking about them stealing your car, they just stole your car again right no now out of the way. church parking oh lot. Oh, my gosh. Not only did they steal your car, it was a woman. She had a baby. She put it in the car seat. We thought it was your wife, Esther. We waved goodbye to her, came in the church and seen your wife in service oh and realized we made a mistake. <laughs> That's what you get for driving a Cutlass. <laughs> <laughs> a week later, my car is totally stripped down in Compton. Jeez. So now I'm jobless, I'm carless, and my pastor comes to me and offers me a church in Tacoma, Washington, and pastor was going to go do mission work, same thing, prayed, didn't feel peace. He said, no problem, we'll send you to Chicago. And then the next day, we went to a hospital. My wife was seven months pregnant with our second child. And uh, she, it was one of the most crummy hospitals in L.A. You got to see a different doctor every time. And we were already there going, and this doctor said, your baby's dead. There's no heartbeat. And we think the baby's been dead a while. And we're like, I was just here a week ago. We seen a heartbeat. Can we do this again? And they're telling us in the hallway. It was horrible. My wife's crying. I go, can we go? And they go, it doesn't work that way with the insurance. You have to make an appointment. It'll be a week. So a whole week goes by. The church is praying over Esther. I'm praying. I'm like, this is where you get a miracle. God's going to move. And then all of a sudden, um, uh, we go back. And the baby's dead. And so they induce my wife to have a labor for a dead child. And the doctor's telling me, stay with her, help her with her IVs. The restroom is going to make her sick, of course. And this took forever, 11 hours. And I help my wife to the restroom, and the unthinkable happens. The baby comes out in the toilet. I run and get, this is a true story. I run and get the nurse. The nurse starts saying, what are you doing you can't be out of bed. I go, the doctor told me to help her. My wife's in shock. She grabs my wife and the baby, puts my wife in the bed, puts a blanket over them and says, look, the nurses are on strike. There was a strike going on and Jeez, they were geez. overcrowded. We'll get you a doctor here. You're going to be okay. And she left me in that room with my wife, 
my baby, and God and the devil. But I'm sitting there going, God, all I want to do is preach the gospel. This is four weeks before conference. They did a DNC on my wife to remove everything, and they hurt her. Where Esther bled every day for six and a half years after that. And we could not have children again. And when I mean bled, we went to the, they couldn't stop the bleeding. And my son, we have one son, found her asleep on the bathroom floor. And he woke me up as a little kid and said, Dad, mom's asleep on the bathroom floor. No, she lost more than half the blood out of her body. And she had to go to the hospital. That's why we were pastoring. So back up, that's happened. All that's happened. Conference comes. They announce us to Chicago. Someone was going to Mexico City. Other one's going to La Puente. And, or no, Pico Rivera. And uh, I'm beat up. And I went in the bathroom that day because I got a graveyard shift just to get some money, changed my clothes right afterwards at the conference and went off to go drive. I drove a truck. And then three weeks later, we're in a meeting with uh, the guys that are going out, kind of like prepare ourselves to go out and pastor, reports, ordination. And, and the assistant pastor is running the meeting and goes, hey, pastor wants me to ask you if you'd be willing to go to Kansas City. And I looked at him and I go, and my wife's with me, and I go, every time you guys offer me a church, something bad happens to me. Mm. And he goes, I know, I, he really feels God in this. We have two families there. Will you pray about it? I'll be honest with you. I said, yeah, I'll pray about it. But in my heart, I wasn't going to pray about it. I literally walked outside, and my wife goes, I really feel God. I go, woman, I pray way more than you. We ain't going. <laughs> and I went to church the next, well, the following Sunday. And my pastor walked up to me. He goes, hey, boy. He's from Oklahoma. He goes, you ready for Kansas City? And I said, yeah, I, I'm not going. And he said these words. Yes, you are. And I started to cry because I knew I was going to do what he said. Now, I know this may bother some people, but I'm going to tell you something. I quoted Hebrews 13, 17. The Bible says that obey and submit to your leaders for they watch over your soul. I quoted it to him. I go, the Bible says this. You'll give an account to God. I go, if you say it's God, I'll go. He literally said, it's God. I need you to come by the office tomorrow and get a check to get a U-Haul truck. You got to leave Tuesday. And he walked away from me. I want you to think about that. Now, I was telling uh, Reuben, everyone who wants to live by plan B, God's permissive will. No one wants to look for God's perfect will. I, I look at this. I'm very thankful. Did not God tell Abraham to sacrifice his son? to test him. And then God said, no, because you're not willing to do anything back. God did, God did tell him to do something, but didn't make him. He's testing him. I look at that was a big test in my life. Because I, there's no way anyone can tell me it wasn't God. But I can't take away from my story without that happening. See, I don't look at that scripture in Hebrews 13, 17, you must obey and submit me. I literally read, Everyone says, I fear for pastors that love to throw it. Someone says, I look at the last part of the verse, that you'll give an account to God. Right. There's a balance there. Well, if you fear God. Right. And so, like, so it takes a lot of courage to speak into somebody's life to go do something like that. So let's get it right. Yeah, God put them in your life, but also for those that God put in your life, God put us in your life to help you fulfill your destiny. So that yeah. it goes both ways. I think this generation's upset because there's been a lot of people that have been branded, you come help me fulfill my destiny. Right, right. Like a big right. Ponzi scheme. Yes. Okay. That doesn't mean everyone's called to preach or go out and do mm -hmm. things. Everyone's got their place. So if you keep on reading, it says Christ puts every part in the body as he sees fit and causes growth of the body. You can't do this without these guys. You need them. They need you. It's all there. And can't. I think you could point out extremes on either side. I mean, there, there is such a thing as abusive leadership, controlling leadership, manipulative leadership. It is. But there's also such a thing as a rebellious churchgoer, a stubborn churchgoer. And I think avoiding both extremes, you come into God's perfect plan where there's that balance, that trust in God, the honor for his word, the honoring of the position on the part of the believer, 
and the honoring of the position on the part of the one who God has chosen to lead in that, per, that particular we're, season. We're attracted to the failures of men. Mm. We're attracted to the bad scenes. But for every bad, there's a hundred good. Probably even more What do you good. mean we're attracted to? What do I mean? So when somebody falls or did abusive, um, we, uh, we highlight that. But when people are doing good, we never highlight that. We just expect that. I'll say it. What is discipleship? It's the epitome of trust. It's the epitome of trust. We can talk about discipleship. You can do classes on it. You can read books about it. But the reality is it is you sitting at the feet of somebody else and you imparting your life into another human being. That is actual discipleship. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm on this, for me, I'm on this whole thing right now. I want to get the lost saved, but I also want to get the saved to get the lost saved. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 10, I love this. Paul says, I think it starts at verse 30. He says, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord. Don't give an offense to the Gentile, the Jew, the Greek, or the church of God. But then he says this, I don't do what's best for me. I do what's best for others. That they please them, that they might be saved. Okay? That's the last verse of the chapter, verse 33. But people don't realize, it, I mean, you do, chapters and verses are not in the actual letter. And so when they put those together, if you look at chapter 11, verse 1, it's separate from verse 2. The actual King James people that laid it out got it wrong. It's wrong. You look at it, it's in everything, it's separate. It literally starts at verse 2. So what's verse 1 is supposed to be verse 34. Because if I'm a pastor, and this is the problem with the church, I'll do whatever it takes to get somebody saved. I'll, I'll, I'll please you. I'll do what's best for me. And we're clapping like this. Oh, that's my pastor. He does that. That's what he does. He's such a good dude. He gets people saved. But the problem says is the next verse, which is separate. It's supposed to be verse 34. And you should imitate me as I imitate Christ. So that adds so much to this. That means, and that Greek word imitate is the word meti, which means carbon copy. That literally means that the pastor is supposed to live a life of reaching people, and he puts the mandate on the church, you should copy me, which comes down to, do we live a life worth copying? If God came down from heaven and said, I want to copy you, I want everyone to wow. use you as a blueprint of your prayer life, mm. your witnessing. And, and, you know, we could all say, man, I don't understand the Bible. Well, I, we all know how to copycat. We did it as kids. You know, someone's got to live what we preach. Someone's got to believe this. And, and me, for pastors, I mean, our whole mandate, it, it, is this good? Because I'm... This I'm, is great. I'm incredible. So, I have a question I want to go back to in a moment, but, sure. but finish well, this thought. To me, Diga, everything's about heaven or hell. Everything. Everything. Even the miracles that God uses you brings glory to God that people turn to God. That, uh, everything. It's about that. And we've spent so much time that we're salting the salt, but not mm. salting the earth. What's happening in the world today is not Democrats or Republicans' fault. It's the church. The church is not, we're telling people about church. We're not telling them about Jesus. I literally have told my church for five years, stop telling them about the cure church. Tell them about Jesus and they'll just come. Tell them about Jesus. Quit telling him, come invite me to my church because it's the soul winner at your job, at your school, wherever you're at. I mean, Easter, Christmas is coming up. Unto us a Savior is born, a Savior to save us of our sins from going to hell. Easter, death and resurrection Sunday, took the keys from hell, so we don't have to go to hell. Everything's about that. No one wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. Unless a man be born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. And I just think with all, all of this, the whole thing about trusting leadership and so forth, it should all point to fruit, not people from other churches, but fruit of getting the lost saved. I mean, that's how I, I mean, these guys died in the book of Acts. 
to get people saved. They died. And, you know, church growth in America is the lowest. We have big churches, but conversion rates, one of the lowest in all the cults. Compared to all the cults, they're growing on conversions. Mm. But Christianity ultimately is not, uh, you know, so I, I, my passion, I, I still believe people need to get saved or else they're not going to see heaven. And I don't want to be around somebody that's not saved and I could have told them and they go to hell because I wasn't obedient. That's heavy. And it's something that I think needs to be talked about more often in the church. I want to take a moment to go back sure. to that moment where you're standing there hearing this from your pastor. So your pastor looks at you after you've been expecting to go to Chicago. Yeah. And he says, no, you're going to go to Kansas. Basically saying, this is what we're going to do. Now, a lot of people who don't understand the relationship dynamic between you and your pastor, how much you trusted him and how much he loved you, they might look at that and say, well, that's, that's controlling or that's manipulative or that's abusive. Right. And I think that this speaks to a broader issue, namely that the church has trouble balancing that dynamic. We are so afraid sometimes of controlling, manipulative, uh, overbearing leaders that we miss out on the opportunity in spiritual growth areas that comes from being able to trust in a man or woman of God that God has placed in your life. And then sometimes the opposite is true. We're so worried about people missing their destiny or labeling them maybe as rebellious that, that sometimes we can get a little overbearing. And I think that that relationship that you had with your pastor and what you're speaking of speaks to that really well-balanced dynamic can you share a little bit about your relationship with your pastor and speak to that trust and love so that people can kind of get more context for that? Yeah, so if I really want to peel it back, it, 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 in the beginning, he didn't disciple me. Um, that your uncle in the garage discipled me. And so it goes back to Im imitate. What, he was already a leader and watching him do that. So you can watch people obey. You know, it says obey and submit, for they watch out for your soul. Obedience is doing what you're told. Submission means do it with a good heart. Mm. So you can tell your kid to take out the trash, and like they're playing PlayStation. Ah! Or they would say, Father, it is my honor to remove the trash. <laughs> I, we never got there in our home, but <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so... And then you have to look at the whole picture, okay? How is he treating his wife? How is he treating his family? Who's under this man? And how's that man treating him? There's a broad, okay, this isn't some guy barking orders and he's living a controversial life. There, there's a lot of your testimony that plays there. You know, um, uh, so back then, I mean, I, I didn't know nothing. And yeah, so let me back, let me get straight to your question. Uh, my relationship with him was more, he, he wasn't a man that walked off the stage. Now, did I go to his house? I went to his house one time at like midnight when me and my wife were in a fight and I got rebuked. That was about it. Did I go over there for dinner and hang out like all the guys do in my church? I, no. He was too big. The church was too big, too many churches. But, you know, when you're with somebody, so me, you know, I got, this is how I got to know him. I knew they opened up prayer at five in the morning. And uh, I work graveyard. I said, I'll open it. And I knew if I go to prayer on my way home from work, I can hang out till he shows up and just hang out with him until he would tell me, you need to go home. I got work to do. And I go home and go to sleep. But that's how I found my way to wow. do it. You know, the Bible says, follow me as I follow Christ. I, who, Matthew, I'll leave the 99 for the one lost sheep. I'll chase the one coin, next parable, for the one lost coin out of the 10. But then there's the prodigal son. He doesn't chase him. We don't chase rebellion. We chase the lost. Okay, he had to learn on his own. But Paul is saying you got to follow somebody. 
it's, that's what it is. Jesus said, follow me. That call to discipleship is uh, 72 times in the Gospels. The call to discipleship, that's leaving, following, and so forth. And there, there's element of faith and trust. Uh, uh, so when he said that, he earned that right. The, you know, you have to earn credibility. It's not given. You know, people can do it for a minute. God can give you a title and a calling, a ministry, but what you do with it demands the respect and honor. So when somebody just throwing around, you need to obey me, and you're looking at this life and the damaged lives around them, like, dude, I, I, why, are you even, why am I even in this church? The Encounter Podcast is sponsored in part by the partners and donors of David Hernandez Ministries. Your monthly gift or one-time donation enables us to reach the masses with the gospel of Jesus Christ through events and media. Join the movement and unite with thousands of believers around the world in supporting this growing, effective, evangelistic ministry. You can begin your partnership today for as little as $15 a month. Visit davidhernandezministries.com slash partner to become a monthly supporter or davidhernandezministries.com slash donate to give a one-time gift. So when somebody just throwing around, you need to obey me, and you're looking at this life and the damaged lives around them, like, dude, I, I, why, are you even, why am I even in this church? So um, he earned it. But not, not, no favors. He just earned it how he treated people and seeing the fruitfulness in people. Um, and yeah, so when he did that, that was the first time I felt like he did something that hurt me, not in an evil way, but like everything was cool. I never had that. Now, I get it, the toxicness in ministry and stuff we see now, it's so scary. Gosh, just in the last couple of years, what you've seen in big ministries around our country, around the world, it stinks. But again, I would say not every preacher is that way. Right. You know, not every used car salesman's a crook, <laughs> you know? Yeah. They're not all that way. It's just not fair. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous, okay? Mm -hmm. There are good people that are really trying to serve God. It doesn't mean they're perfect, you know? So uh, it really wasn't that hard for me to, in that essence, to trust him. So we'll jump back forward again now to where you're talking about in discipleship. And this is a topic I think that, that really is close to your heart. It's in there, my book. There aren't that... <laughs> <laughs> where, where is the book? Do we have it? Vlad, do, do we, we have, have his it? book somewhere? I think they're in the... I think Rupert put them in the trash. In the green room. <laughs> <laughs> no. Can we grab his book, please? No. Ruben, did you throw them in the trash? Uh, no. No. Okay. So then they should be in the, in the green room. The good in, book. In, I'll in give the, it a in chance. In the guest green room, Vlad. <laughs> Speaking of this topic of discipleship, this is something that I feel is almost a forgotten message. It is. You don't hear this. We hear about maybe church growth, membership in general, spiritual growth, all great. Nothing wrong with that. No, they but all in, have their place. But in terms of this call to radical devotion to following Jesus, I think the name of your book is something along the lines of... Burn your ships. Burn, burn your, your ships. ships. Uh, yeah, bring that in here, Vlad. Thank you, my friend. Um, yeah, I have Burn Your Ships right here. Talk to me about the title. Uh, Cortez, you know, <laughs> he uh, discovered the Americas. And when he did, uh, in that long battle when his men ran to the shores, you know, they're hungry, they're thirsty. His attitude was, okay, we're all in. Yeah. He burned the ships. And the only way they're not going back, they can't quit, they can't coward. If there's any possible way of them going back, they would have to conquer the enemy and take their ships. Wow. What does that look like in the Christian life, burning your ships? To go, until you're willing to pick up your cross, deny yourself, then come follow me. That's actually a prerequisite of being a disciple. Here's, here's a challenge about discipleship. Not everybody is ready to be a disciple. There's good, and I, I know there might be some semantics in my language here, the word Christian is only in the Bible like two times. And they're kind of like, they first called them Christians in Antioch. It means little Christs, little Jesus freaks. 
King Agrippa, when Paul's confronting us, you're, you stop it, Paul. You're almost persuading me to become a Christian, a little Jesus freak. Mm. So that's it. But the, the word's disciple, okay, matheteo. It literally means, you know, an adherent learner, sitting at the feet of somebody, imparting into them. Okay, so you can't disciple somebody who's not ready to be a disciple. And I think that's where a lot of people get this, they get offended, they get mad when it's a discipleship culture and there's a barely a new convert, barely becoming a Christian. And you try to put the heaviness of discipleship on somebody who's not ready to even be a disciple. Okay, now, I, honestly, I believe everyone's supposed to be a disciple. I never believe that Christianity is just God to save you and get you out of hell and forgive you of all your mess, and that's it. No, he wants us to be a part of his kingdom or part of his plan, period. And uh, we're supposed to reproduce. But I think sometimes where it gets bad, and then church culture does this. Like I said earlier, hey, there's a discipleship class. We can preach sermons on discipleship. and We can teach a class on it, but somebody actually has to do it. And you, you want to hear a crazy story? That first week I got saved, I didn't know nothing at all. And, well, I know I'm in a friendly environment here. If I just got saved. I went back in that garage, and a demon attacked me. Now, nobody, I thought I was crazy. What, I, what, do, I, what do I mean by that? I'm not asleep. I'm wide awake. Something's scratching me, choking me. And I'm like freaked out. I don't know nothing about angels, demons, Holy Spirit. I don't know nothing. All I know is I got Jesus touched me. This went on every single day for a week. And I'm this tough dude that wants to fight everybody, everything. And now I'm scared to go in a garage. And then at about three in the morning, I'm wrestling the invisible man. I got scratches on me. And I ran out of the garage, not even thinking. I don't even have clothes on. I'm running out, scared, and I'm pounding on the front door. And he opens the door, and he goes, I go, dude, do you, do you, do you know something's in the garage? I'm fr- I, I don't know what to do, man. I, I can't imagine what was going through his mind. What he didn't say, he, he didn't say, dude, you know what? I got two kids. You're scaring them. He didn't say, dude, I got to be at work in, in two hours. What, what are you doing? You know what he said? He said, come in. He put me on his couch, and he put a blanket on me and got on his knees and started praying over me. Mm. People don't understand that because if he would have shut the door on me, I know me, I know what I was like. Oh, these Christians are fake. I knew they didn't care about me. I was looking for that. Then um, that month, a couple of weeks, three or four weeks later, there was a men's meeting, men's discipleship, and the church was real big back then, and a bunch of churches came together. And he, he had a low rider van, and we went cruising and down on Woody Boulevard to this men's discipleship, about 600 men, and this guy's preaching on integrity. We need to be men of integrity, men of integrity. Everyone's shouting. I'm quiet. I'm, I'm brand new. I'm brand new. And afterwards, uh, your uncle, you know, he doesn't really know me that well. And we get in the van, and he goes, hey, so what?" he's asking me, so what did you think? And I, I got quiet. I go, I started crying. He goes, what's the matter? I go, what's integrity? He goes, what do you mean? I go, I just realized I can't read. I don't know what the heck that word is. I felt like an idiot in there. And I'm crying. I'm like, dude, I can't sell drugs no more. How am I going to get a job? What the heck's going to happen to me? Reality hit me hard. And I, I, he's just holding me, and, he, and I'm crying, and he goes, look, it's going to be okay. He said, after work on Monday, every day, meet me up front. He had no idea what I was going to do in my life. He didn't know that God was at the call of God was on me. He had no idea I was going to preach all over the world be on TV, doing books. He had no idea what, I'm just a dirty little punk rocker with blue hair in his garage. Then right after that, I get a knock. 4.45 in the morning on the garage. I go, what the heck? 
And he goes, hey, we got to pray. I don't know how to pray. He goes, I know. Kneel down on the couch and listen to me. And I heard him pray for his wife. I heard him pray for his kids. I heard him pray for the church, for people to get saved. He goes, now just, just say what I say for the people in your life. That's discipleship. That may be extreme, but that's what it is. Giving your life to somebody. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul said to Timothy, the things you heard and seen in me, commit to faithful men that will teach others also. That's Paul, Timothy, faithful men, others. That's four generations of impartation right there. Was there ever a point when you're... In... Oh, you're still here? Yes, I am. <laughs> I was reading your book. Okay. <laughs> uh, was there ever a point when you're in Kansas City because you're like, oh, man, I'm going to do what my pastor says. You're pastoring for, I don't know, weeks, months, whatever the amount may, t- may be. Does there ever come a time where you're like, oh, okay, I understand now this was God? Uh, you want to know the first, and I'm, I'm a street preacher in LA. I'm a soul winner like crazy. You, you heard those stories in those days. We're on the street corner witnessing. We're crashing parties, preaching. We're going crazy. You know, I go to, and I, I'm like, I'm bringing so many people to Christ and to church. I go to Kansas City. One year, one salvation. Wow. One year. I, it was a rude awakening. One year, nobody gets, one person gets saved. And the, the girl that got saved, she, she was in church, and she's, it was New Year's Eve service, and she's pregnant. You know her. She's still in my church, Pamela. And she literally was like 16 years old, nine months pregnant. I go, when's your baby do tonight? I go, do not have that baby in my church. <laughs> she gets saved, her and her boyfriend. And then a couple of weeks later, he drives to church in a car. He tells me, God bless him. No, he did a home invasion and put, oh, wow. a, put a bag over a lady's head and her kid's head. Him and his friends stole the car, came to my church service. She backslid, robbed a bank, you know, embezzled $30,000. So it wasn't, it wasn't like the cleanest salvation. Now she's one of my main leaders. She's a school teacher in our community. Great lady, phenomenal. That's 30 years ago. But I went a whole year without no one getting saved. So feeling that, yeah. I, I, I didn't feel like a mistake. I just felt like, man, what am I doing wrong? And like one time I said, God, I didn't even want to come here. Yeah. I'm like... But then uh, then when I, I prayed that prayer, God crazily opened this door that this um, Christian radio station called me and said they heard my testimony. And the guy literally said, in Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Kansas, is like Los Angeles, Orange County, like two cities, right? But they're two states. I'm on the Missouri side. (laughs) Why am I there? Because that's where I parked my car. I didn't know nothing about it. (laughs) I literally just like, oh, this is a good place. Got a house starter church. And then all of a sudden I get this rate. This guy manages radio station says, hey, and this is the early 90s. So Christian hardcore music and rap is taboo, especially in the Bible. But nobody's doing that stuff there. That's, That's the devil, you know. And this guy heard my story. And he goes, hey, I have this idea for a radio show. And I met him after work, and he goes, um, I, I feel God wants you. I don't even know this guy. He the, runs a radio station. He goes, I feel that God wants you to have, do this show. I'll give you half an hour for 50 bucks, and that's really good. And I feel I want you to just play this music and just be yourself and just talk and live calling show. And I'm like, I'm not interested at all. I'm like literally working a full-time job. And he goes, and I go, let me pray about it. <laughs> that doesn't mean much because that literally means when you're a young guy, and you're going to pray about a brand new pastor. That means you're going to go home and call your pastor. That's literally what it means. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm in there and he goes, you know, I feel the Christian bookstores were big. We're going to get other churches. I, want, I just feel this is God. You can interview the bands when they come through our city. And he goes, I'll give you, an hour for 50 bucks. 
And I'm like, I laughed. I go, great, just let me pray about it. And I put my hand on the doorknob, and he says, stop. I know this is God. I'll give you two hours. I mean it. This is God. So I went home, and I called my pastor. And he goes, what did you tell him? I said, I told him I'd pray about it. He literally said, you dummy? That's God. <laughs> I'll give you the money. This is your open wow. door. Nothing's happening. Within two months, I have a five-hour show, wow. and they're paying me. And that's how I got this breakthrough in my city. And then he finally said they had a big chapel underneath this, uh, like kind of your thing, a chapel at the station. They go, start your church here. Move your church over here. I won't cross state line again. And everything opened up. Jeez. I was playing old school gospel gangsters. You can't even play that on the radio no more. <laughs> yeah, you know, and rock music and, and then just like doing altar calls. It was like crazy. It was, we get like 60 calls from young people. Wow. Yeah. So looking back on all of this, what would you say are some other pivotal moments where you've had to make that decision to, so to speak, pick up your cross? Because many times we imagine that once you reach a certain plateau, you're kind of just coasting from there. I mean, we heard this radical testimony, this story of transformation. You're converted. You come to Christ. You get delivered off of drugs. You marry your wife. You begin to go through all of these different um, steps to fulfill the call of God for your life. The radio station deal happens, revival breaks loose. And now sometimes we imagine you kind of sail off into the sunset. Everything is perfectly fine. But would you say that the sacrifices become more intense? Would you say they're that different. They're, they're, how so? they're different? So you preach for me your first time on a Sunday. The first time I ever preached a Sunday morning service was 16 years old, I believe. That was at your church. Yeah. That building, and we had a revival. And if you were there, you know, people, our friends, other pastor friends that are older, like, what are you doing? I go, dude, you guys are dumb. Hand of God's on this, dude. I got adults, 16-year-old kid. They're all slain in the spirit of my parking lot. <laughs> it was phenomenal. And we had to go all the time. It was great. And uh, um, yeah, but that building, I... Someone, I just got my first house in my entire life right before that building. We were in a storefront. And uh, we outgrew the storefront. And me and my wife were driving home. And we, somehow we went down a different street. And there was that, that building you used to preach at. And it had a for sale sign. It was a Baptist church. And my wife goes, I feel that's God. I'm like, girl. I literally said, are you kidding me? We can't buy a building. We, did, we didn't have nobody. I think back then we were maybe 70 people, not enough to get a loan or anything. But then you know what she said back to that original story? She goes, you know that feeling I had? when the, I go, don't even, I'm going to call. That feeling about coming to Kansas City, she was right. right. She always throws it in my face. <laughs> and so I called the number, and I don't even know how it happened. They, we, they, we got the, we inquired on the loan. Everything was good. They said, you don't qualify. And I, and I said, all right, what if I sold my house and moved into the church? Wow. My wife looked at me. I go, if we're going to do this, let's just do it. Wow. I sold my house and they, they said, yeah, you qualify. And we moved into the church. And uh, me and my wife and my son, we were there for about three years, and the church has exploded for us. You know, and we grew real big. And uh, then they said, hey, the space that we were using, we needed for offices. I'm like, what do you want me to do? And that's when you know the guy in my church who uh, said, hey, I'll build you a house. And just like that. Just like that. And he didn't charge me. And he built me a, a very wow. nice home. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, that's how it happened. That whole scripture, I never planned on it to be that way. But then, you know, the whole scripture, anyone who sacrificed mother, father, brother, sister, houses or mm -hmm. lands for my sake, mm -hmm. we get a hundred more in this lifetime to come. It happened. Philippians, my God should supply all your needs according to his riches in heaven. Right? Well, read the whole thing in context. Paul is talking about a people that gave to his ministry to further the gospel. You can't activate that promise if you don't give to spread the gospel. So a lot of those New Testament provision scriptures that people quote, they weren't for self-indulgence. Now, God is good. So like, okay, if God prospers us, 
Everything our whole life is, is to further the gospel message. Okay, let's just say, if it's just a biblical tithe for him to get, increase your tithe, well, that means your 90% gets bigger. Your, your capacity to give offerings get bigger because you're a steward, and the steward must be found faithful. So yeah, we've all seen where people are trying to uh, manipulate the scripture or try to, I mean, I was laughing at the prosperity guys. Your Bible says that you have to, like, really? Good luck with that, pointing your finger at God, like using the word of God against God. As if we're strong-arming yeah. him to give us something. Yeah, yeah that's you know, ridiculous. Yeah, we've heard all the extremes of that. You know, <laughs> you know there are people that will be rich. It says it in 1 Timothy 6. It says, for those who will be rich, don't trust in the uncertainty of riches. Mm-hmm. Okay? It doesn't say not. I mean, Joseph Arimathea is called a disciple. Right. There's no resurrection without that dude. He bought the tomb. He got the body. He put it in his tomb without him. You don't hear him with all the other guys they are doing it, but God puts in the body a sea fit. You have, I mean, you have people that have been part of this ministry that behind the scenes, they'll never know, but they've been so generous for you to share the gospel around the world. It wouldn't happen, okay? So, yeah, it's trust. Can you be trusted? I believe God would love to prosper a lot of people, but money's evil. The love of money's evil, rather. And like, there's some guys, I'm convinced, they're going to just only stay saved if they're broke. <laughs> mm. Because if they get money, they go out and do stupid things. They, right. just, they just get pride gets in there. Money reveals what's inside of you. Yes. It's inside of you. Okay? It, you know, we, we sin because the lust inside of us, and money buys lust. Not just perversion of sex, but materialism, all that. Which, not wrong, like you said, control. Is there anything in your life that you can't walk away from for God, you know? Uh, and he may not do that, but I've heard stories really well. The issue is, are you willing? Right. That's what counts. Is your heart willing? Uh, how do you compare eternity for here? Do we even believe you're going to go to heaven? I mean, this is your life, 80 years if you're lucky, you know, 80 years mentally normal. If I'm talking like, People I see are politicians. Throw me out back. <laughs> um, but how hard is it? To give eighty years compared to eternity, and heaven or hell. Yeah. And have heaven or hell, and then your like eternal reward. We're so concerned how we're going to live here instead of there. Wow. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks about Christians always worry about not going to hell. What about the judgment seat of Christians, the judgment seat of Christ, where it says Jesus in 1 Corinthians 3 will take all of our works and he'll get a censer and he'll light them on fire. And some will have wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, gold, precious stones. Whatever survives the fire is your eternal reward. Wood, hay, stubble are earthly motives. They're earthly materials. And the Bible says you'll be saved by the ash, by the fire. You'll just have that, no reward. It's all burnable. You had it all here. Gold, silver, precious stones are eternal things. The only thing that's eternal is the soul. It's what you did to get people saved and proclaim the gospel. That's your eternal reward. And Christians today... We live this life. What's my least commitment to God and go to heaven? Wow. What's my least commitment to God? It's like the Olympics. Well, if you want to call that the Olympics, <laughs> my Lord. We won't get into that. But like <laughs> you send someone to America from the Olympics. What is her name? Simone. She's from Texas. The, the gymnast girl. Yeah, Simone. Simone. Phenomenal. Imagine if we sent her there her fourth time and she just said, yeah. I don't really care about gold. I just wanted to get a T-shirt. Mm. No. You represent America. We represent the King of Kings. We're ambassadors of Christ. Why would you not go for gold for what God did? Why would you not give your whole life to, for eternal reward? You know, <laughs> that's, that's Christianity right now. And it's interesting because even when I look at your life, just as a testimony... 
I can probably not name that many who I can say are that radical in their obedience and willingness to take steps of faith, to sacrifice. And then on the other hand, I can think of very few who have as much favor as you walk in, even in things in terms of this world, material gain and so forth. Not that that's what you're after, but I've seen people, they just kind of just like, okay, who has someone come up to them and say, hey, I want to build you a house. That just doesn't, that doesn't just happen. And yet knowing your testimony, there's story after story after story after story of these moments of great favor that make people just scratch their head and say that would never happen, yeah. but it happens in your life. And I think that's very closely related to the fact that you just live this life where you say, Lord, whatever you want. Yeah. It, <laughs> Christianity only comes alive when you do something. Mm -hmm. It's boring. I couldn't handle just sitting in a church and hearing someone talk and hear Ted talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I, my mentality is okay. God, speak to me today in this message, okay? All right, let me go do it. Wow. What he said, let's go do it. Let's see what happens when a husband and wife pray. Let's go, what happens when I go share the gospel with someone, or lay hands on the sick. They said, in my name, so let's go do it. What the heck? We're not supposed to go to church. We're supposed to leave and be the church. And so my stories are great, but I tell my guys, where's your story? We're fascinated. We read stories in the Bible. Why? Because they did something. Just do something. It don't have to be, you know, I'm just burned out. Oh, man, I feel called to go to China to preach the gospel. And you don't even tell people about Jesus in a Chinese buffet. It's like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. You want to go around the world and you've never, never have knocked on your neighbor's door, your mm. next door neighbor and say, hey, can I pray for you? Do you know Jesus? Your wow. next door neighbor. They want to cross the seas, but not the street. And Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And you want your literal neighbor. They know you go to church. They see you every Sunday leaving, dressed up. <laughs> it's bizarre. And then like, we're going on a missions trip for the church. We're raising money. And nobody on your blocks ever heard the gospel. Mm. Jehovah Witnesses have came by. The Mormons have came by. The, the Girl Scouts have came by but not the Christians. It's just bizarre. I think this is a message the church needs to hear. Burn your ships, an unapologetic manual for leaving empty religion for a life marked by revival by Kelly Lorkey. Where can people get this? Uh, KellyLorkey.com or Amazon, other places out there. K-E-L-L-Y-L-O-H-R-K-E.com. Pastor Kelly, thanks for being here. I'm honored. And I'll leave you with a question for conversation. Can you name an instance in this season where you've had to carry your cross and what did that mean for you? Thanks for joining us. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.